So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and get tonight's program started off. Um, I want to start by welcoming everyone um, to this third Thursday with the Allentown Art Museum. My name is Abby and I'm the Adult and College Program Coordinator at the museum. I will also be the host for this evening's dynamic conversation in which our renowned speakers will offer their insights into questions based on the themes and scholarship of our upcoming exhibitions, Print and Protest 1960 to 1970. This exhibition will open this Sunday, October 18th, and remain on view through January 24th, 2021. Through the course of the program, we encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A portion of the chat, and we'll do our best to answer those. So with that out of the way, I'd like to, I'd like to introduce our moderator and our speakers. Um, I'll start with our moderator, who is our, our curator, Claire McRee. Claire McGree received her MA from Bard Graduate Center in Decorative Arts, Design History, and Material Culture. She is the Assistant Curator at the Allentown Art Museum and the Curator of the Exhibition, Prints and Protest, 1960 to 1970. Up next, we have our first speaker tonight. His name is Curly Holton. Curly R. Holton has been the Executive Director of the David C. Driscoll Center at the University of Maryland since 2012. The David M. and Linda Roth Professor of Art Emeritus at Lafayette College as well. In Easton, PA, Holton is a printmaker and painter whose work has been exhibited professionally for over 25 years in more than 30 one-person shows and over 80 group shows. His exhibitions have included prestigious national and international venues, such as Egypt's Seventh International Biennale, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. His work is in many public and private collections, including the Cleveland Museum of Art, Yale University Art Gallery, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. As part of his research and study as an artist and scholar, he has lectured and presented demonstrations throughout the United States and abroad in Europe, Mexico, the West Indies, and Costa Rica. He has presented over 70 public lectures on the subjects of his work, African American art, and contemporary printmaking. He has written numerous articles and essays on art and artists that have been published in catalogs and journals. Holton received his MFA with honors from Kent State University and his BFA from Cleveland Institute of Fine Arts in Drawing and Printmaking. Starting in 1991, as a professor, he taught printmaking, African American art history, and the history of protest art at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania, and was also the founding director of the Experimental Printmaking Institute. Welcome, Curly. Thank you for being with us. Our other distinguished speaker tonight is Susan Cart. Dr. Susan Cart joined the Art, Architecture, and Design Department and the Africana Studies Program at Lehigh University in 2013. An assistant professor of the Arts of Africa, her research specializes in the arts of Francophone West and Central Africa from the colonial period to the present. She has been published internationally, both in the US and in Senegal, a decision she made based on her research pedagogy of placing material in front of the audiences for whom it is most relevant. As an educator and author, she has demonstrated deep commitment to scholarship and activism that showcases the diversity, complexity, and unique histories of African art. Through her work, she actively dismantles centuries of Eurocentric writing that propagated false myths of primitivism and pre-colonial authenticity, which have been harmful to students and scholars alike. Some of her recent projects have been curatorial in nature and based in educational pedagogy, which allows her to tie her publication record to practical and tangible interventions into the spaces of art, consumption, and education. In 2019, she worked with a group of students to produce the exhibition, Equilibrar, Strength in Community, at the Lehigh University Art Galleries 
to honor the 10th anniversary of the Lehigh Alumni Group for People of Color. This exhibition features works of Lorna Simpson, Andre Serrano, Faith Ringgold, and Curly Raven Holton, who we have with us here today. Um, this show highlights the strengths of the Lehigh Valley art collections, which are dominated by artists of color. This exhibition pays tribute also to the non-white populations at Lehigh and their experiences both on and off campus. Equilibrar is on view at the Siegel Gallery in Lacoca Hall through December 2020. And as Susan mentioned um, to me just before the start of this, to see the show, just call the galleries and make a reservation. So with all of that said, I'd like to kick us off with Claire and her very first question to get our conversation rolling. Take it away, Claire. All right. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. And thank you, Susan and Curly, for participating in our conversation. Um, and so just a word about the exhibition, Prints and Protest. Um, this exhibition draws from the Allentown Art Museum's collection and looks at artist responses to the events and unrest in the 1960s through printmaking. Um, it features works that respond to the civil rights movement as well as the Vietnam War. And you'll see works that look to American history to comment on the present politics that document current injustices in this era of the 1960s and also borrow images and text from other sources using the tactics of pop art to create political commentary. And many of these artists have varying views on appropriate ways to take action, whether that's through their art or through personal activism. And so that's a really great place to launch into the first question I wanted to share with our panelists, which was, which is what is the value of art as a vehicle for activism and, and how does that fit into the context of, of other activist actions like marching, writing to elected officials, et cetera? Could I respond first? Is that okay? You know, protest art has a long distinguished history and some of that history is very obvious to us from Goya, uh, Picasso's Guernica, and many others, including artists that are in the exhibition. But I started thinking about this uh, uh, in, a, in a broader sense and some of the issues that protest art raises. Uh, I, I, it was mentioned that I work at the David C. Driscoll Center as his director, and that center is committed to the legacy of Dr. David C. Driscoll, who was considered a foremost authority on African American art. And that title came to him when he organized this major ex exhibition of 200 years or two centuries of African-American art it, from 1776 to 1976 that was shown at LACMA in Los Angeles. And during this process, he told me how some of the curators at LACMA threatened to resign if they did an exhibition focused on African-American art. And in the end, they made, the institution made a commitment and a curator did resign because of that. There were large questions in society about the relevance of this, this all black exhibition, whether there was some, any merit in it. And in connection to what we're talking about, the very idea of presenting the story, the experience, an existential and intellectual life of African Americans itself was an act of rebellion. It was an act of protest. And it, it, it appears to be kind of passive and historical, but when you go back and look at it, it was, it created a lot of upheaval because this was a body of material that institutions did not consider as relevant. And in the end, David impacted the entire canon with this. And there were critics that said that there was no real art being made by African Americans. And I think how that connects to what we're doing is. Part of the protest is the telling of the story that is not told, the story that's in the shadows, and also a certain kind of witnessing. I think we see it in the work of uh, Vincent Smith and others. It is an act of witnessing, sometimes an outrageous crime, social injustice, so that it is brought toward, to the foreground. And if it's brought to the foreground, there's hope that all moral humans will recognize it and take action to change whatever is causing this 
crime or this social um, uh, sort of uh, discrimination or barriers. So I think it's interesting that it's not always an overt object that stands as it, as a symbol of it, but it can be the very notion of speaking of your reality in a public space that gives no space for that reality. Absolutely. That's, yeah, I love the idea of telling the story and witnessing and making the story heard, that itself being an act of protest and, yes. and art is a really important way to do that. Absolutely. Um, Susan, did you have anything you wanted to add? Sorry, first of all, I wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. It is an honor to sit next to Curly Raven Holton, even virtually. And uh, it's a real thrill to be part of the Allentown Art Museum's commitment to this exhibition. So thank you, Claire, um, for all you've done. And Abby, thank you for all your work with the educational programming. I think when I think of protest art and activist art, I agree with Curly 100%. You have works of art that seem overtly activist that tell a narrative. I'm using one behind me this evening that's by the African-American artist Carrie Mae Weems who felt very strongly that because the communities of color were being disproportionately impacted by COVID, she launched this public art project to reach people in um, traditionally black and brown communities so as to convince them to try to keep themselves safe and healthy. So that is one instance where we have kind of very classic an artist with a public message. They're attempting to get it out to the community where they want it. But it goes back to that idea of witnessing who are we telling our stories for? Who are these artists wanting to reach? Who are the audiences that are most relevant to the work of art because of who actually needs to hear the message? Mm. Um, it's not always that an artist of color feels the need to make art about his or her people because they want to tell the story of racism. It would be nice not to have to do that. What's really key sometimes is realizing that many times art about racism is not necessarily for an audience that already understands racism. In other words, our black and brown communities. Many times art about racism is for we white people who need to understand better and need to be able to witness what we have not been able to see from within our own skin. And so I think this exhibition helps us do that. Yeah, that's, that's right on the money. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Um, Abby, is it possible to um, screen share so we can have some of the images? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and if you could advance to the next slide, since we were just talking about Vincent Smith. Um, I think um, it's really interesting thinking about issues of audience and who is who are these works for, um, especially thinking about the medium of printmaking, which historically has been a means of free speech and, and a means for protest because you can make prints in multiples, they're reproducible. And that's the theme of this exhibition, looking at the medium of printmaking. But in the case of this exhibition, we actually have artists who, for the most part, they aren't making mass produced prints that would be used as posters or carried in marches. They're making fine art prints that are produced in more of a limited edition and would be intended to be hung in a museum or in a home in a gallery. Um, and so how does, how does fine art fit into these ideas of, of audience and of activism and protest? So it's, uh, it's a long tradition, as I mentioned earlier, of fine artists like Goya and Picasso and others are using the, the fine art process to make commentary on, on issues. Goya and the disasters of war, uh, Picasso and Gornica, using that platform. Because early on, this medium is very much like we go to films now. It's the way in which uh, images are brought to the public space and discussed. The idea that a fine art practice, especially a fine art practice, turned into a political uh, tool, I think was established during a WPA program, the Works Project Administration, mm -hmm. where artists were brought together 
to talk about being uh, a citizen, to talk about patriotism, to talk about race, to talk about culture. And these artists were encouraged to do this. But even though African-American artists, in the case of Vincent Smith, who I knew personally in New York, was always struggling with survival and struggling with his message being accepted. And as uh, Susan mentioned earlier, these artists didn't always feel that the only voice they had was the voice of an African-American who had suffered social discrimination and racism, but they had a voice as a human so they could speak about larger issues. Uh, example, Romeo Bearden not only captured the interior life of African-Americans, but also spoke of the interior life of all of us. So it's interesting that these artists transcend these uh, very limited spaces that are made available. As I mentioned, WPA program and the Harlem Renaissance, although it gave platform, in many cases, they only wanted the message to reinforce this notion of uh, the old Negro, as an example. And that new Negro that came out of that was someone that had a fuller personality and a fuller sort of individual content. And I think the work of Vincent Smith that you've shown speaks of not only uh, using the medium, but talking about issues that are beyond uh, uh, his own community. He's saying, I can speak about the world, not just the Black community that I live in. So I think that also connects to what Susan said, that it can be broader and uh, it's not always restricted to one's community. We see this in Carrie James Marshall's work. Again, Carrie Mae Wings, it's about humanity and about the betrayal sometimes of humans uh, betraying the sort of moral covenant we have with each other, supposedly. So it's about the betrayal sometimes, and that gets documented regardless of racial background or cultural background. Abby, I wonder if we could really quickly go back to look at the, we have two images by Vincent Smith that we were gonna show this evening. The one that you had up briefly, and then there's the other one, Mississippi Incident. So this is Housing Northern Style. Um, this eight, this series of eight prints was actually re-released in the early 1990s after Vincent Smith did them in the 1960s, in 1965. And he was doing them in response to the civil rights movement. And looking at this one in particular, um, this one really strikes me as being one of the very important ones that does deal sort of directly with racism, but in this, in this fine art modality. What you see here is a member of the KKK, but it's not the typical member that you see wearing a white robe. This is an individual wearing the black robe um, of the Nighthawk. And the Nighthawk essentially was the security force for the KKK to protect Klan members as they were holding rallies. And so you see the individual in this dark robe um, that has the Klan symbol on his shoulder. And that individual is facing us, the viewer, as if we're there witnessing his actions. And there's an individual facing him, this white man that we see from the back with a gun, as if they're having a conversation sort of between the two of them. And we're put in the position of being part of the white audience, you know, included in this print as part of the white individuals that are meeting and conversing with the KKK individuals depending on your screen resolution or how much you wanna zoom in on this image from home, in the back is a structure that looks like a church or a meeting house and there are two African-American individuals walking past it. And I'm pretty sure, and you should correct me Curly if you know differently, but I'm pretty sure this references the situation where folks from the um, nonviolent student coordinating committee were down in Mississippi helping to register African-Americans to vote and they were threatened, they were cajoled, they were essentially run out of town on a rail because folks um, in various parts of Mississippi, Amity County in particular, were not wanting the African Americans to vote. And so this is really a piece about the, the confrontational nature of the, the Klansmen and what they thought they were standing for and the rights of individuals to vote, which I think is really significant because we're looking at that issue right now in our own times of voter suppression and voter intimidation. And so I think these are things that as Americans, we should realize are not new. This is not the first time they're happening, but they're happening again, kind of for the first time. And so we, I think pr a print like that by Vincent helps us, helps us remember that. Also Vincent suggests with the imagery that there's a collaboration between the Klan and what appears to be a law 
uh, mm -hmm. official to the right. You can see the billy club. So there's this close relationship that is, uh, especially blacks were suggesting was operating all the time. This, this sort of collaboration and partnership to keep blacks restricted. And, and of course you're right about the, the protests and the, the young black white um, activists that came to Mississippi that were ran out and later a number of them were murdered if you recall. So yeah, that's a great piece. But again, both pieces speak of what we've been talking about, both the, the ability to make commentary on the larger social interaction, as well as uh, a specific cultural event or social event. Definitely. Thank you so much for, for both sharing kind of a deep dive into that image. I actually learned some new things about it, um, which was really wonderful. And for me, I think, I chose that image, I wanted to include it this evening because it's something that does feel very relevant in the present moment as well. And I think really underscores one thing in working on this exhibition is just thinking about how much of this is still with us today and we can still learn from in the present moment. I think it's a piece also that raises a concern about uh, the dynamics between the subject matter and the facility of the artists. You can see this as drawn very direct, sort of crude, not a lot of modeling, not a lot of sophisticated drawing, but the message seems to be primary. In some cases, artists, the facility and tech technique becomes primary. So it's kind of interesting to look at that and understand the role that it is playing. Absolutely, yeah. And actually, Abby, if we could pull up the, um, the slide that shows the Larry Rivers mm. piece, um, I think that's an interesting contrast because in Vincent Smith's work, the story is pretty clear to the viewer um, and that message is pretty clear. But in Larry Rivers, this work, which is from his Boston Massacre series and is called Black Review, it's a little bit, it requires a little more background knowledge and more reflection maybe to kind of decode it and understand. And I wanted to ask our panelists about when an artist is making an activist work, how, you know, how do they kind of balance those desires both for their message to be very clear and immediate for the widest audience versus having a more complex and subtle kind of message that they wanna tell. Yeah, I think Larry Rivers achieves that, uh, as did uh, Robert Rauschenberg achieve it as well. But there's this sophistication which image making, but a very disturbing subject. And he is, in this piece, he is speaking of Cypress Addicts being murdered during the Boston uh, massacre at the Boston Tea Party, but also, so it, it brings a history forward that not every American knows about. But at the same time, in the foreground, you see what seems to be a contemporary piece, perhaps taken from a newspaper uh, uh, about a protest in the South where a young black male has been beaten to the ground. So he's suggesting that these events uh, continue. Yeah, I think one of the things I find most striking about this piece is that it's part of a larger series. So similar to the Vincent Smith series of eight etchings that were reprinted in the 90s to commemorate that moment in his own work. This was a series that Larry Rivers did in, the, in 1970 on the 200 year anniversary um, of the Sunday's kind of bloody massacre in 1770. And in 1970, of course, uh, in Larry River's own time, we're dealing with the civil rights movement, um, we're dealing with the Kent State murders, we're dealing with um, social and civil unrest that the United States hadn't seen in a very long time, and protesting the, the various politics that were engaging university students, also um, the, uh, the kind of African American and American coalition against the Vietnam War and the struggles that the nation was pursuing externally that seemed to be anti-democratic, uh, to put it nicely. So I think this idea of bringing history forward into the present tense is something that as a historian, I really appreciate. And I love that artists do this because it allows us to remember that these very, that the beginnings of the United States were very violent. I mean, if we're going back to 
the Boston Tea Party and the Revolutionary War against England. This is not the first moment of violence in American history. We have to go back to the landing of the first settlers and violence that was enacted against Native American populations to really get at the nut of why violence has always been a crucial part of the American reality. And so in 1970, it was the reality of the violence of the ongoing Vietnam War and the sort of domestic civil unrest. And if we pull this forward now from 1970 to 2020, we're looking again at international concern over wars that never end in Afghanistan and the Middle East. And we're looking at um, a civil structure that the population is still upset about that's creating, continuing to create entrenched poverty and disenfranchisement for populations of color in the United States. So I think looking at Larry Rivers' portfolio and seeing what he saw in 1970 and seeing what we see now in 2020 is, is really interesting. I also want to point out um, the University of Kentucky is putting up this entire print series by Larry Rivers uh, starting next month, actually November 10th, and it opens and runs until April. So I don't know if any of our audience are in, going to be in Kentucky during that time period, but you can go see the whole series of all 13 engravings, but you'll also be able to look at it online on their website. So we're, we're shamelessly promoting museums of, of all rank here this evening. Yeah, just to reinforce that uh, context for Larry Rivers, uh, not only an artist that was very sensitive to these issues and the uh, Kent State massacres and the things that were happening, is Larry was a, a jazz musician who was very close friends with Miles Davis. So he was very close to that community. And you know, Miles Davis was quite an activist also, uh, not as much publicly, but very much privately. And so uh, uh, Larry Rivers, although he came from a Jewish background, was, had an intimate witnessing. It was a, he was a part of it. He wasn't an outsider making a judgment or observation and that this event and these activities were uh, spectacles that he could uh, evaluate. He was a personal witness. And so I think part of his, his relationship with Miles Davis and other African-Americans made him very sensitive to this history. And he may have heard this history in conversations with these individuals because a lot of African-American history has been oral history, word of mouth, not documented. And we see this uh, on a regular basis. But it's interesting too, with the $5 bill, I wasn't sure about that scene. First, I thought it was Kent State, and but Kent State was a much, little bit later. This was 69, but it made me think about some other events. And you recall when then Governor Reagan had uh, National uh, Guard forces come into San Francisco to the university and remove uh, people that were just planting trees and flowers on the campus because it was state property, had them removed by force. And it makes you think about what happened with President uh, uh, Trump in Lafayette Square, what he did by with force moving uh, peaceful protesters away. So it's amazing that this, this constantly repeats itself. And that's to touch on this notion of, of violence, of uh, overt violence or subtle violence. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting theme we see in this exhibition is just artists revisiting the past from the perspective of the 60s. And now from our own perspective, we have, you know, further evidence of this kind of cycle of history. And so I wanted to bring us to one final question for discussion before we open it up for questions from the audience. Um, which was just to ask you both about how in the current moment with the renewed activism we're seeing, what can we learn from these artists and their work? Mm. Well, from my perspective, it suggests there's a history, uh, a legacy that can be built upon. This is not new. This is not the first time out. If you go back to the 1960s and uh, movement, Black Arts Movement, Nafra Cobra, that had a community-based relationship where the community members participate in creating great murals. Well, murals have become uh, uh, quite important as a part of the American pra uh, studio practice and creative art practice, but even more relevant now. With George Floyd, you have large murals in the inner city uh, acknowledging his life and his death and paying homage to him. So that mural becomes a very democratic form of, of 
art making, very much like the printmaking. Printmaking is the most democratic form of printmaking, of art making, that is accessible to the public. But think about the murals that are now happening that document these events, that represent a challenge to authority. So I think that's going on. And there are a number of exhibitions that are happening around the country uh, that are around the theme of protest art and art that has been made recently as a reaction to the social upheaval. I'm in a, part, a number of these shows, but there are also artists that are established artists that are then creating opportunities for young emerging artists to have access to venues and to promote their work and museums have seemed to make a, made an effort, a major effort to reach out to a lot of these artists and make them a part uh, of uh, uh, you know, their programming, their exhibitions and a permanent collection. And I think that's a direct result of the protest. I think if we keep to the idea at the moment of the youth and the next generation that Curly brings up as far as the generation of artists being ushered into the, the next group that's being ushered into this sphere, I do want to acknowledge that in the Lehigh Valley, we have multiple institutions of higher education. So we have multiple college campuses and that puts us in that familiarity as a region with student culture, um, student protest, student activism. And we've seen some of that. I think it's obviously very different now in times of COVID when students are essentially not encouraged to gather publicly in, in any capacity. But I think we have seen, as you point out, Curly, with all of the recent outdoor protests that people have been willing to risk their lives to go out in the streets and protest again, because things just aren't changing. Um, you mentioned that $5 bill art project. I don't know if you want to bring that image back, Abby. I did some digging around and I think, I think Curly's right. That $5 bill, even though we're giving it a date here of 1969, is a modification. It's a sort of mass produced pamphlet that was scattered around and it does appear to be in response to the Kent State shootings of May 4th, 1970 and I found the picture I'll just throw it up as my own background here and I'll just move out of the way this is the picture that has been moved into the center of the five dollar bill in the place of Abraham Lincoln and so when you think about taking Abraham Lincoln who was responsible politically at least for the end of the institution of enslavement and being replaced with National Guard forces from uh, Ohio being dispatched to Kent State to shoot their own students. Right. It really tells you something rather terrifying about the state of democracy in 1970. And I think we're seeing these same seams of violence of National Guard and unidentified kind of secret militias being present at public nonviolent protests in order to create a sense of fear mm -hmm. um, and restraint on the part of the protesters. So we are actively watching our First Amendment rights be threatened through these actions. And so for students, what I wanna point out is that there was a generation of students ahead of you that had to deal with this on their campus, that had to deal with people showing up in armored gear with dogs and semi-automatic weapons. And I don't know how far away we are from that happening now because we're seeing it happen in our urban cities. And I think our campuses are, are also gonna be vulnerable spaces. And I, and I say that not to, threaten or scare our youngsters that are out there, but to point out that fear is funny the way it works because what this image behind me shows you is that the government was afraid of college students. Exactly. Afraid of college students. And so they were trying to gain their authority back by making the college students afraid. So authority and fear are two really interesting concepts because they both only exist in the minds of the people who need to be controlled by those emotions. Authority only exists if we believe in the authority of someone else and their authority to tell us what to do. And fear only exists if we allow ourselves to be afraid. And so I think these, these concepts are really fundamental for all of us, but I think they, they are illuminated beautifully in the works in this exhibition at Allentown. Well, I think you're right, you're correct. You know, these levels of authority, they operate on so many different uh, levels as we encounter them from a, it could be a, a, uh, a, a state facility that we have to go get our license at, you know, as well as, you know, higher government and the military, but it's so many levels we encounter uh, 
that are telling you, the message is stay in your place, stay status quo, do not mm -hmm. challenge the authority or the power. And once that power is challenged, of course, the reaction sometimes, oftentimes is violent. But I think you're right, a, a great terror. I, uh, I exhibited some work in Atlanta some years ago, and it had, most of the work was about protests, uh, events that had occurred, and I was very disturbed by them, and I began to make images about those events. And over time, I started to consider what would make a person uh, perpetrate a crime like a racial crime, or what would make a person uh, discriminate against another human? How could you look in a person's eyes and not see God in that person's eyes? How is that possible? And yet you could dehumanize them and debase them. I was intrigued by this idea of what has to be in place for this to happen. And so the last part of my body of work was a bit more philosophical, a bit more existential. And the critics said, well, you know, Curly starts off roaring like a lion and ends up baying like a sheep, you know, because mm -hmm. he missed the whole point that I'm suggesting that, it, as you were, that it's something larger operating, not skin color, not gender, something else is operating here that's far more sinister than that. Mm -hmm. I think as of now, I'm not seeing any questions come in, but just a reminder to anyone who's watching, you're welcome to share questions in the chat. Um, Susan, well, I, you wanna? I, I had to bring, I had to bring this one in. <laughs> uh, where'd you get that at? I found this on the internet. Um, <laughs> this is not a print that's in the Allentown show, but this is a work by Curling Raven Holton that I wanted to share. And given that it deals with what he just speaks up to, um, not going out like a sheep, I wouldn't, I wouldn't verbalize it that way at all. But this is a work from 2020, right? From this yes. year. Yes. Um, and I wonder if you'd be willing to share with the, the audience a little bit about this, this particular piece. Yeah, of course, it's, it's obvious that it's about the hands up movement. And I wanted to the work that I've been doing recently is not about these issues, but I wanted to make a statement about it. So the young man has his hands up, surrendering. And if you look on the pocket, like you can't see it on the screen, there's a, a, a spot of blood on his pocket. And that is from me. So it was just a, a suggestion that there, it could be violent and it touches all of us. And the, the halo on the back is actually called a nimbus. And the Nimbus was the original kind of indication and of status, heroism, uh, great generals received this kind of anointing pre-Christianity. So I thought I would attach it to the young black male's uh, body as a sign that he was more than just a young black person that could be victimized, that there was a heroism there, there was something that was transcendent there. And that's what the gold uh, uh, halo is about. Thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there. Yeah, but I thought it was. I thought it was a beautiful, a beautiful piece to bring into tonight's conversation. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, I want to start with one from Infamous Oculus. Um, this one's for Curly. It says, Curly, what do you think is operating beneath the surface of the obvious, the more sinister? thing. Uh, I think he sent that as we were looking at your piece. I think it's fear is what I think it is. And I think it has a lot to do with this collective ego. And what I mean by collective ego, if you've noticed that whenever you touch someone's ego, it can be very dangerous because it challenges their sense of well-being, their place in the world, their self-esteem, mm -hmm. a sense of value and authority. And if you challenge that, it's a very dangerous thing, and I, I'm always mindful of that, and I tell my children that be careful, don't touch, play with any wise ego, because it is, it is a defensive mechanism, and I think the larger American ego right now is threatened. I heard some uh, commentators speak uh, yesterday about a similar subject, and he unpacked it in a, lot, in a way. He suggested that a lot of these things were in place, a lot of of, of um, disenfranchised men, not by, just by African Americans, but white Americans who felt disenfranchised, that their voice wasn't being heard, that uh, they felt depressed about the world that they were living in, that they didn't have choices, 
to mitigate that world. And I think some of the uh, things we're dealing with now are coming from that place. Could you imagine after the 1960s, almost 50 years later, for there to be protests in the streets about black lives? Can you imagine that this is happening? If this happened in the 1950s and it's happening now, what does that suggest? Well, white America in most cases thought this problem was resolved and tended to. But of course, it was never tended to because a sense of well being is very important. And for the most part, most African Americans don't feel that sense of well being. Even uh, the current uh, candidate for Supreme Court spoke about having two black children that she's adopted, and she had to sit down with her own children and tell them that their lives may be threatened in a way that her other children's lives are not threatened by virtue of being black. Can you imagine what it was for a child to uh, accept a, a uh, abstract thought like that? We're in a, within the home, it's very secure, very protected, and you're having validation and support for your personality. So I think fear is underneath it, fear of a loss, an imaginary loss sometimes, and this make America great again, this strange nostalgia, I think is a very perverted kind of nostalgia. First of all, I, I find nostalgia kind of uh, threatening anyway. I'm very cautious about it because if you're in the past, you're definitely not in the future or in the present. So this idea of nostalgia is it gets something back that never really existed. So I think it's a fear that is underneath most of it. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I find really interesting is how much attention right now is being paid to artists who are looking at these current issues in real time. So without having to wait for artists to sort of sit back and think and make some work, and a few years down the road, we see art about systemic racism and COVID, we're seeing it now I mean, yes, directly right. behind me. Um, I also wanted to point out that in the New York Times just today, there was a brilliant article, um, a long form article called the most influential 28 of the most influential protest works of art mm. and it was two curators three artists who put this together and it's i'll put the link to it in the chat because i noticed that uh, norberto has put a comment in about the silence equals death poster by act up during the 80s which was a, a creation um, of an artist collective to confront the aids crisis that was not being confronted by the political government and the silence equals death poster with the pink triangle has become one of the most famous works of protest art kind of globally as a result and this article in the new york times includes it as one of the most influential pieces so i think what's lovely is that some of the artists in the allentown exhibition are in this new york times article i mean not from within the allentown exhibitions context but in the context of having produced this very powerful protest art over time. So this, this article takes us from World War II up to the present, and it's, it's really worth a read. Great. Um, I want to pose one last question, just so we can get to and from the audience, but I'll make it quick. And I, I'd actually, I actually want to be Noberto's question, um, which was, he talked about the silence, um, the hands up and the silence equals violence. Um, but what do you think will be the most memorable protest art that we're seeing today? What do you think is gonna stand out in 20 years from now as, as one of the most potent pieces? Well, I think from my perspective, uh, the work of Carrie James Marshall and then Carrie mm -hmm. Mae Weems, as Susan mentioned, is extremely powerful work and work that will, I believe, uh, become significant over time, even more significant, because they're, they're so, both are so smart and they understand what they're doing. And they understand that the work is articulating a position that is so well thought out and so strategic and so clear. And I think that work will last. And the work is redemptive. This idea of Carrie James Marshall, for example, painting these lamp black figures at, you know, totally black. No, there's no ambiguity about it. And from his perspective is to assert that there is a reality that has been denied by institutions and there should be no apology for the presence of that reality. But he does it with such clear arguments and such clear thinking. The Astor Gates is another who's making work. And I think that work will really, uh, uh, you know, 
transcend time. And it reminds me of a, a great line in Bob Marley's, one of his, his songs called, the only song I have is my redemption song. Mm. The idea that the work is the redemption. And we're still in the state of redemption. It's interesting too that the African-American, we've talked about the context of protests and most often we think about African-Americans, we think about uh, women liberation, we think uh, about gay and lesbian rights. Those efforts to redeem themselves and liberate themselves liberated everyone else. Mm -hmm. Everyone else benefited from that liberation. So it's not just those that are oppressed or downtrodden that are liberated from their action. And I think Martin Luther King understood that. If I can show you my humanity, then your humanity will come forward also. That's beautiful, Carly. That's hard to top. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, great conversation. You know, I haven't, I've talked, I get into a lot of discussions about subject, but this has been a great one. I haven't had a chance to talk about these issues like we've talked this evening, which is great. Yeah. One of my favorite artists uh, is actually not a visual artist. She's a musician and she goes by the name Beyonce Carter Knowles. Oh, yeah. And what I find so incredible about Beyonce, and this actually tackles another couple of questions that were coming into the chat about what would a concept be that would make kind of activist art different from everyday art. And I think Beyonce does that. She offers us an alternative view of black femininity and black masculinity that is not held down by these kind of negative stereotypes of either the underprivileged, the underserved, the victim, uh, the prostitute, the black mammy, any number of very negative stereotypes that are associated with blackness in this country. And she presents the image of the black woman as a goddess, as any number of goddesses, oh, uh, as a queen, um, as a king, in fact, she actually will take on masculinity as part of her own feminist project. So I think that what she does visually and in her music is she looks at the history of African American musical genres and she performs pieces in every single one of those genres, whether it's country or soul or jazz or R&B or hip hop, she uses every single musical style that has been kind of created by African-Americans throughout history. And she recreates those with her new lyrics for today's times. And then she puts these visuals with them that also draw from the history of enslavement, but also the history of African religions that were brought over with enslaved individuals that made their way into American culture and into American popular culture. And so she actually injects these very complicated histories into our own pop culture, where the young folks are who are sitting there listening to her music and watching her present herself as kind of the non the non-stereotype that, that we've all been told to expect. And so I think Beyonce has allowed for younger artists like Lizzo to come into the musical scene who is going to say, my body is not the typical body that people think is beautiful, but I'm gonna represent that body as the body of a beautiful black female. And so I think that this has encouraged a lot of change in the way black femininity is to be understood going forward. And so I think that music actually is another one of those areas where we're gonna see a, a lot more change. Yeah, without uh, permission, without apology for Beyonce. Uh, when I was doing the research on the Halo and the Nimbus, there was a video that she did for, I think it was the Emmys, where she was dressed in this gold outfit with mm -hmm. these halos on and I was, it was amazing. And I think maybe eight months pregnant. So yeah. her abdomen was exposed. As yep. I negate, <laughs> no permission and no apology to bring it forward. And I think that's a great example of protest. That's right, that's right. Well, we're right here at that 50 minute mark. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to say a big, big thank you to Curly and to Susan. Thank you both so much for joining us and offering your time, your insights, your expertise. We really couldn't have done this without you. You guys have been absolutely wonderful. And Claire, I wanna thank you for your thoughtful questions and for your tremendous research and the work to highlight all of the complex history that we've spoken about in the Princeton protest exhibition.
Um, I want to put one last plug in. Don't forget to actually visit the exhibition at the Allentown Art Museum. The grand opening is going to be this Sunday, October 18th, um, and it'll be open through January 21st, or sorry, 24th, 2021. Um, you can reserve your tickets ahead of time at allentownartmuseum.org, and we hope to see you all there soon. Thank you so much again, Susan, Curly, Claire, and all of our attendees. We'll see you guys soon. And thank to Allentown for uh, Museum for hosting this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.